Green Rush, Mining the Energy Revolution with Matt Watson. Hello, welcome to Green Rush, Mining the Energy Revolution. I'm your host, Matt Watson. Each week, we take a look at the periodical table and we take on yet another element in the context of this clean energy transition and how these commodity markets are being affected. Today, we have another special guest, Mr. Bart Malik, the Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Strategy for TD Bank. Bart, welcome to the program again. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Not a problem. Uh, I was going to give you a chance. Perhaps you can uh, describe to us, Bart, quickly your role within the um, TD Security Framework here. Well, as you said, Matt, I'm the Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Strategy uh, for TD Securities. So it's not just me, it's uh, me and, and uh, my team. And uh, our fundamental role is to support the trading desks um, in various centers around the world. That includes New York, that includes Calgary, uh, Houston, London, and Singapore. Um, our function is generally to give traders and clients um, uh, our views about the metals, provide trade ideas, and look at some fundamental uh, supply d demand uh, conditions for uh, our area of coverage. And that includes, of course, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Uh, we also cover uh, the LME metals, um, copper, zinc, nickel, um, and um, lead. Uh, and of course, uh, aluminum, uh, we also look at crude oil, LNG, and petroleum products, uh, and, and of course, uh, natural gas. Uh, we, we have a, a unique, uh, I, I think, approach um, uh, on the street, uh, uh, both you know, unique on Wall Street and on Bay Street uh, in, in Canada, where we look at the supply-demand fundamentals, we look at financials, and we also look at flow of funds to try to give us signals and an idea of what these markets are likely to do in the future. And if we think there's some sort of an equilibrium or if we see pending demand that's not substantiated by uh, supply, uh, we'll have an opinion, uh, we'll issue an article explaining what we think, why we think it, and we also manage um, model portfolio where we uh, uh, will put on trades uh, that we ultimately uh, publish. And that includes our target, uh, that includes uh, our, 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 and our uh, stop. Um, so far, we, you know, we, we had uh, fairly decent luck using the, this approach. And in this way, we inform both the client and uh, our um, trading desks uh, and the broader investment bank uh, of uh, what state of uh, the commodity market and where it's likely to go is. Fantastic. Now, you know, in my view, you're one of the, the best, most comprehensive analysts on the street today. Um, it's one of the reasons, <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've developed a, a relationship with you, a friendship with you is uh, I, I really do value your insights. <laughs> I, I always chuckle every time I meet with you as I show on the slide here, just the number of media appearances that you make, it's uh, its staggering, Bart. You're, <laughs> you, I think, rank number one in terms of frequency of, uh, of interviews. So uh, you're very accessible. Um, so thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we do make an effort, uh, myself and my team. Of course, it's just not only me. It's uh, 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 <coughs> Daniel Valley and Brian McKay, who are also part of the team. And, uh, you know, they the, do their fair share um, of appearances and work uh, as well. So with, with their help and our, our macro team uh, as well, our FX team, uh, we're in a good position to be informed about the, the global market and makes things a lot easier for us. It, you know, it looks like we're all doing it all ourselves, but it's with a lot of help uh, from within the institution and, and, and colleagues like yourself as well. And by the way, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind words. Well, you know, I, I think there's value in studying the commodity markets writ large, right? I, I think there's specialists that get into individual metals, and and I think that they're lacking in many cases because they don't have a broader context, and so it forces you to to view the whole market as a whole, which I, I think is absolutely needed in today's environment. So let's jump into our, our conversation for today, and that's gold and silver. And here's a 24-year historical on the uh, the fix. 
And um, it, it's just shocking what's gone on here in the past couple of weeks. I, I think it's fantastic for gold and silver both. Uh, that's why I, I had this program scheduled later in the year, but I, I pulled it up based on these uh, most recent market uh, spikes. And, and you know, I, I, I want to go through some of this data on supply and demand with you on, on gold in particular. You know, when you look at gold and over this 24-year history, it's averaging, uh, you know, the fix is increasing with a CAGR of about 8.8%. Silver is growing at about 7.8%. Um, there's some noise around that, but the R squares on both these are, are close to 90%. So fairly strong just time series correlation that these things are climbing over time. Um, and yet we've seen a, a really significant spike here. Can you talk specifically about this most recent spike that we're seeing, Bart? What's driving uh, this? Sure. You, you know, I, I would like to touch on your on your finding that uh, uh, these prices have been uh, trending higher on average. Of course, you know, we have interest-driven uh, ebbs and flows of ups and downs. Uh, but, you know, what you've said is, is critical to the right. validity of precious metals like gold, like silver, uh, to be the protectors of, of wealth or, or headers. Um and, and, and the reason for that is they are real assets. And I, I can't stress that enough. It takes real labor, real capital. Um, it takes energy to get those physical products from the ground. And during inflationary periods, it could be with a lag, uh, but gold and you know silver to uh, an extent as well, has been following the 90th, 95th percentile of the global cost, cost curve. So right. as price indexes go up, so do the cost of extraction. And therefore, the price on the margin moves higher. And for those who purchased early, find that they are well protected against these surges in prices. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And most, you know, recently we've seen, a, a, you know, a very impressive rally in gold. We've seen, uh, I think, you know, hopefully a, a, a very impressive to come even more impressive rally in silver. And I think much of it has to do with the fact that the world uh, of, you know, investors and hedge funds and, uh, and normal individuals are thinking that we are potentially in a world of escalating prices for the long run. Um, we are in a world where we see geopolitical risks rise. In fact, we're you know, seeing evidence of central banks, that would be nations, taking very large positions. Uh, you know, in fact, record purchases over the last two years, well over a thousand tons in each of the years uh, to protect themselves um, against potential geopolitical angst. Uh, uh, you're seeing China again, People's Bank of China, uh, buying gold. Um, they are $3.2 trillion uh, heavy in FX reserves and only have some 4.3% in gold versus, you know, United States, which is over 70%, Germany in the high right. 60s. Uh, you know, even Russia has a lot more. And as geopolitical risks rise, um, there could be a falling out. We're already seeing, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration proposing a hundred percent tariff on EVs. Um, right. We're wow. seeing tensions in the, you know, South China Sea uh, rise, and there's the potential. I'm not predicting a conflict or anything like that, but the risks are rising that there could be a clash between those two superpowers. And oh, things like sanctions, uh, you know, like the ones we've seen levied against Russia, which rendered half of their foreign reserves unusable, those in dollars and those in euros. Gold, they apparently were able to use. Uh, so I think we're seeing part of that attract people into gold. And then there are massive problems down the road demographically. Populations are aging, and not only in the Western world, but also in China. Uh, and, you know, we in the West have mass obligations, in many cases unfunded, in terms of social security, medical care, uh, and so on. U.S. is already posting a $34 trillion uh, debt, um, growing according to the 
uh, Congressional Budget Office at 1.6, 1.8 billion dollars over the next each, you know, over the next two years. And the question is, what happens? How do we fund all this spending? Uh, you know, very much Americans don't like to pay taxes, uh, but like a lot of spending, you know. And I think the market is fearing monetization down the road. Absolutely. You know, one of my basic premises in, in all of my analyses is, you know, with this clean energy transition and this push on all these commodities, metals markets, copper, silver and the like, you know, it's it's going to be very inflationary by nature. That's the only way those plans are going to succeed is with those commodity prices climbing. Otherwise, you'll never generate the mining, you know, in enough volume to, to, to drive the market to meet the demand. So uh, I absolutely agree that you were bringing up geopolitical risk. What about Taiwan? Um, you know, I've stressed in every one of my talks the importance of Taiwan, and just to highlight a, a few key points, they're responsible for 90% of the san, seven nanometer and below, or fine pitch node, the most advanced chips uh, in the world. The foundry, they own about 90% control of all the advanced nodes. So everything involving AI in particular would be impacted mm -hmm. if China mm -hmm. were to act on Taiwan. Do you see that as being a, a legitimate risk here in the, in the next year? Well, you know, I... I, I, I'm in no way qualified to say if, if that is a, you know, a, a real risk or not. Um, right. I, I certainly don't know what is in the, you know, the, you know, the, the Chinese Politburo. Uh, but I, I can say that investors around the world uh, are starting to believe that mm -hmm. it is a growing risk. You know, we're seeing yeah. activity in the South China Sea. Uh, we're seeing aggressive rhetoric from the United States directed towards China. We're seeing mm -hmm. economic measures. Uh, you know, whether there is a bona fide, uh, you know, military conflict or not, I don't know. Uh, but I think the markets around the world are starting to price in that mm -hmm. very possibility. And certainly mm -hmm. from a policy perspective, uh, we're, we're seeing the United States uh, subsidize chip making within the United States, you know, onshoring. Um, uh, and, you know, if you're looking at the behavior of various governments, uh, you're looking at military, uh, you know, patrols and formation of island sort of aircraft carriers. Uh, sure. You have to say that the risk is growing. Um, yeah. And if I'm sure. a central bank that's aligned, you know, not with the Western world, uh, I may want to have a, a little bit of diversity in my FX portfolio. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Well put. Well, let's talk. You know, I'm a pretty fundamental supply and demand guy. So let's talk about the gold um, supply and demand statistics. This is from the, uh, the World uh, Gold Council, from their Gold Hub. You get a sense here of the uh, supply, mine production versus recycle. Yeah, recycle has been a little bit elevated over our historical, but uh, I don't think anything that dramatic. Um, and yet, now let's roll over to the the demand statistics. It's a pretty simplistic set of buckets of demand here. It's it, it, you know central banks, you know investment products, bars and coins, uh, lots of jewelry, uh, but only six to nine percent historically is technology demand, uh, including semiconductors, electronics medical and diagnostics, and there's a few other areas of demand, but really the industrial demands are are really not that large on gold compared to the rest of the precious metals basket, correct? Yeah, and, and that's been the case. You know, gold has uh, is much less of an industrial metal uh, than mm -hmm. silver. Silver, you know, comprises some 60% of the you know, of its demand uh, from right. in industrial sources. So they are very different uh, in, in that way. And um, I think the interesting thing about gold, uh, to the extent that it's money, uh, but you know, for what it's worth, I do think over time, uh, as you know, G five or five G becomes you know entrenched and then globally, uh, you know, when when we get more and more EVs that will have massive amounts of computer power in them and, and, and electronics and then eventually self-driving. Uh, 
as that market spreads outside of the you know highly industrialized nations uh, globally, uh, uh, you know, gold is uh, as of course I'm, your audience most likely knows is an excellent conductor. So I, I right. do expect that industrial component uh, to to grow slowly. I still think it'll continue to be a monetary metal. And that's what makes it very, very different than all the other metals. Uh, unlike copper, unlike aluminum, when you use an ounce of gold, you know, you, it doesn't usually get lost. We don't throw it out. It's in some sort of inventory and it's relatively easy to recycle. And right. unlike other metals, there are thousands and thousands of tons of above ground inventory held by central banks, by bullion banks, and by investors. And right. what makes it different than all the other metals, its peers, is that it is a lot more sensitive to the interest rate environment because right. as the costs of carry increase, incentivizes inventory holders to lend the metal out to swap it out and outright sell it and substitute it for bonds which yield you know you know in today's case a two year bond is almost at 500 basis points on you know uh, 4.96% or, or or something uh, like right. that. so unlike all other metals gold is a lot more sensitive to the financial environment and we found one of the biggest drivers uh, over the longer term, is the real interest rate. The difference right. what between inflation and what bonds are paying. And right. I think part of the reason why we're expecting, why we're seeing you know, gold at record nominal prices, and in fact, we're nowhere near the record real price. When I go back to you know, uh, the pre-Volcker era, if you recall, uh, I've estimated in today's dollars, price was about 3400 five, five or something like that. So much higher than it is today. So there are potentially in real terms is still uh, ways to go. Um, right. But that will very much depend on what the real yield is. Uh, we've right. already said that gold over the long run tends to follow its production costs or, or, or inflation because it's a real asset. And the, the bond market is basically, you know, yielding less than the risk profile would dictate, you know, less right. inflation, given the inflation environment. You may be better off holding gold as a protector of your wealth than fixed income assets. Right. Uh, so, in many ways... Gold is not so much a function of inflation, but really a function of monetary policy response to that inflation. And, you know, given the trillion of dollars of current debt in the United States, and, you know, the United States is not unique, uh, countries like Canada and European countries as well, Japan have massive budget deficits, uh, demographics that are going, you know, the wrong way. Um, right. and taxpayers that are, you know prefer not to pay taxes. So how do you fund this? Well, you might fund this by spending. Uh, and essentially, you may have potential growth that is too high for the economy's ability to deliver goods and services, and that results in inflation. I think we've seen a taste of it where the Fed you know, generated trillions of dollars of money and uh, initially, nobody you know, took mind of it and thought it was transitory, but we've since had inflation. What we had is right. so-called negative supply shocks in labor markets, if you call, in logistics, even energy, because OPEC cut supply. And what do we do? We accommodated those shocks. You know, going forward, uh, we might be doing the same thing. We, you know, getting a negative supply shock on the labor front over the next twenty years, and the way to prevent the economies from having very low rate of growth may very well be to accommodate it, to monetize it. Uh, right. That could be a, a, a potential solution uh, to to these problems, 
And that means you erode the real purchasing value of money. And, you know, what do you use to counter that? You know, how do you protect yourself? Gold, silver, uh, you know, have been around for, you know, a few thousand years. Uh, they have a fairly <laughs> long, good reputation. And, and I think uh, the market is thinking that this Fed in particular with you know, the current administration may even be worse if we have a Republican uh, dominated government, you know, in next January, um, we could even have higher debts is, well, we could have a Fed that may not be overly serious about its 2% target. It could be more of an optional uh, thing for them. Remember, the Federal Reserve is a dual mandate central bank. Right. Unlike right. the ECB, where they're targeting inflation, they're targeting two policy goals at the same time, full employment and price stability. And that could be tricky. Uh, you know, at right. some point, right. I think they may very well choose uh, to favor growth and full employment if the lower end of income distribution, let's say the 25th percentile of income distribution, gets hit hard by unemployment. Uh, right now, they judge that inflation is the one that's hurting that cohort the most. So they're right. restricted. But that doesn't have to hold uh, forever. And I think the market is sensing that that might be the policy uh, response uh, down the road. You know, what else explains the fact that gold is doing so well? And, and then, you know, Asia buyers, all that, you know, it's not just limited to North America. I'm talking broadly. But the U.S. is still the one that runs the show on interest rates. Uh, that the Fed may very well be positioning uh, for that very thing where they're uh, trying to support employment or economic growth. And that could very well be at the expense of a strict 2% target. I don't know for right. sure. I don't know if anybody knows, but certainly the price action around the world has is, is telling me that investors are starting to contemplate that possibility. Right, right. So on this next slide, just a good segue. I, I've got the central banks, the uh, the gold reserves, um, and you can see the trend. Do you make anything of twenty two and twenty three? We're seeing, a, you know, a spike in 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 the buildup of reserves. Yeah, I, I think you know we 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 started to worry about the U.S. dollar. Uh, everybody seems to have been very wrong. The U.S. dollar outperformed everyone because the Federal Reserve. Uh, wasn't as easy on on, on policy uh, as I think uh, as some expected. You know, a case in point, uh, you know, six months ago or so, we were talking about potentially six rate cuts and a lot sooner. Uh, now we're maybe talking one or two this year, starting in late, of, you know, uh, late summer at the earliest, and potentially uh, not at all uh, th this year. Uh, but but still, I, th I think the fear is that the U.S. dollar uh, will ultimately ease up. Uh, so far, it hasn't happened. U.S. equity markets and technology have been attracting a lot of money into the United States. Right. Uh, the U.S. dollar may be soiled for now, uh, but it's still the cleanest shirt in the hamper, uh, sort of speak. Uh, right. That's right. And I, I think we have to consider that you know currencies trade in terms of each other. Uh, but what really erodes purchasing power is not that, it's inflation that hits everybody, uh, all currencies. Right, right, right. Um, you know, the other thing I noticed is just the ETF flows. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen a pretty successive run of 13 out of the 15 past quarters. Uh, we've seen some liquidation, including the last nine straight quarters now with ETF outflows. Most of those outflows coming from mostly North America and Europe. Um, is, is there enough movement here to cause any concern? Well, you know, and, and that's, that's been a very interesting story because uh, what we've seen is we, we've seen an environment over the last 12 months, I would say, where policy was getting very restrictive. Western right. investors until very recently haven't been interested in gold. Um, and what we've seen is $2,000 range for gold, which is very unusual given that environment. Uh, and we've seen, you know, Asian investors, the, the Chinese 
maybe official sector. Uh, well, we know the official sector. They've been buying, buying for what, uh, 17 consecutive months or so, and they're growing. Uh, uh, they're a, a so we're seeing a bit of a, and ETFs in China, by the way, uh, my understanding is that they have been uh, showing, you know, the opposite. Uh, they've been actually, you know, acquiring right. uh, the metal. And we're also seeing a pretty significant premium uh, in, in Asian markets. So we're, we're seeing a dichotomy here. Now, uh, I imagine that if we start seeing the West and the East pulling in the same direction, once monetary policy eases and, you know, the market gets convinced that um, we're, we're going to have real rates start really falling sharply, uh, I, I think, you know, we, we could surpass these uh, the, these levels. I, I think new records uh, are very much in the cards. You know, we're on the record as saying in our forecast that next year, uh, you know, 2,400 plus uh, as an average a quarter is, is very doable. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm also on the record of saying 2,700 as a trading level, uh, you know, potentially even uh, much higher, but that will very much depend on what monetary policy is doing. The short run, I think, you know, the next few weeks is a little bit more tricky because there's a lot of ambiguity of uh, surrounding when rates are going down. We, we still have a Fed that is giving us a hawkish, relatively hawkish uh, rhetoric. Um, uh, we're going to have to see what the PCE deflators are showing. If, if there is movement, uh, you know, that's positive for gold. If we see them, you know, maybe inch up or energy inch up, uh, gold could sell off a little bit here. Um, but to me, that, that means, you know, those would, are likely temporary dips. And given the longer term outlook, we still think that uh, there there is potential upside. Okay, all right. Um, when you look at the uh, the technology demand, electronics drives this. Um, you know, I'm I'm fairly expert at understanding the, the the form that these gold products are intercepting semiconductor and electronics writ large. Um, you know, there's there's been a decline. A lot of this decline earlier on in the 2010 timeframe had to do everything with uh, gold bonding wire um, and um, design thrifting and alternatives to gold that were being used in the bonding wire market. But but overall, we've seen actually an increase in content. Um, we see it in our e-way streams. I'm a little bit at odds with the uh, the gold council. I got to be honest, the metals focus um, saying that the electronics demand is declining. I think the e-way data and the loadings. Uh, per wafer are actually on the climb. Um, so I, I have a lot of heartburn on the electronics picture, but still it, it, it is in that 10% of the, the total, uh, you know, supply realm uh, in terms of overall aggregate. Um, but uh, just to, just to point out a concern that I see uh, in the data sets that I'm, I'm not quite buying into. And, and really I, I went through a series of analyses. Here's three different ones on one slide here, looking for these market clues. And you brought up this one already. The real 10-year treasury rates typically have an inverted relationship with gold. I think that's true over certain intervals of time, but over a, a long time frame here, here we're looking at, a again, a 24-year history. I, I, you know, you see a little bit of this correlation going on here where it's inverted, but uh, it doesn't necessarily seem to follow here in the, in the immediate term. Would, would you agree with that, Mark? I, I agree. We, we certainly had a decoupling. I think um, that's been very much driven by very, very, you know, record setting central bank uh, buying activity and, and, and strong demand, uh, you know, outside of the Western world uh, that, that's been driving it. And, 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 you know, and that has, I think, uh, been a big surprise for many analysts. In fact, you know, yeah. I, I talked to a, a few of those analysts uh, in New York recently, and they've said, you know, that is something where they've not been that wrong for, for, for quite some time. Uh, right. And we're saying you it know, differently. Many, the, the model many, used to hold up. I'd say it differently. The model used to hold up a lot better. I think technically and mathematically, uh, that, statistically, that's right. the model was right. Yeah, and that decoupling you know, I, of the I'm model sure yeah, the very, left a lot of analysts like myself kind of struggling. Where are we headed? Where are we headed? What other clues should I be looking for here? Right, and uh, it gets tough. I, I think ultimately we do refer to the mean. That relationship, uh, you know, is a logical one, and it will re revert because we'll we'll get used to those flows. Uh, Right. But, you know, to your point, electronics, I, I suspect you may very well be right uh, that uh, we're, we're probably getting more loading 
um, of gold uh, for for these various devices. Uh, but I think the frequency or, or the you know the amount of electronics uh, over the next five ten years um, in our devices uh, of all sorts, and you know that will include you know, smart fridges. Not sure I want a really smart fridge. You know, it would report <laughs> how much and what I eat. Uh, you know, we we should keep some secrets. Uh, uh, but you know, I think we're going to have a lot more electronic devices everywhere. Uh, yeah. Our vehicles, uh, our refrigerator, and you know, uh, maybe our, our our freezers. You know, our TVs are pretty electronic. So, you know, who knows? Maybe personal uh, uh, neural sensors and uh, and and control units. Uh, I, I think right. as time moves on. Uh, we'll see more of it. And gold is, you know, one, it's non-reactive. You can, you know, even embed it in, in skin with, with, with little consequence. And, um, and it is a superb uh, conductor. So you can have, you know, uh, you know, a nanometer thick layer that, that still conducts uh, fairly well and, and, and non-corrosive. Uh, so, you know, I, I suspect, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm qualified uh to argue with with people for the next two years, but I think just intuitively uh, looking over the long run and seeing where technology is moving, where AI is uh, is moving, and as right. those technologies get absorbed into the broader economy globally, um, right. I, you know, I, I I don't believe that we're going to use less. Uh, I think we're going to use more over the long run. Uh, you know, three, four, five, ten years down the road. So. I'll be um, speaking at uh, the LBMA annual conference in Miami this year. Um, they have me on a treasury, um, or excuse me, on a, a silver group. They, 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 they're they curious about the relationship with AI. So I'm glad you brought that up, these AI data centers. If you're an e-waste guy and you're hunting for scrap, the most valued electronics waste on the planet is the decommissioning of these data centers and these AI centers. Because the contents have been climbing so much, the server blades, all the printed circuit boards surrounding all the hard drives that are used. It is the premier target. And yeah, we're having an explosion in AI. So uh, yeah, yeah, another metric that I just think that some of the reporting on this, uh, the technology demands are, are, are understated uh, mm -hmm. a bit. And uh, it's just an area where we could, I think, improve some of the reporting. I don't really see a relationship though uh, holding up uh, with platinum or even the gold silver ratios, looking at those over some larger periods of time. So I, I'm not sure those are really providing any meaningful signals to me. I don't know if you feel any differently, Bart. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of ratios because, you know, they're made up. Uh, I, I'm more interested in, in, in you know, <laughs> well, you know, technicals generally are, 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 you know, are kind of made up. They're not fundamentals. To, but uh, they still work in, in many cases because if you have enough, Pro, uh, a large a large enough proportion of the market believing in, in, in a certain thing uh, uh, they will structure their trades and targets uh, around these levels and uh, and will, will kind of move uh, to them deterministically but but to me it's really the marginal cost of production uh, that right. matters and that I think uh, what's particularly for for silver what's interesting down the road is we're gonna have these structural deficits for i think uh you know at, at least for as long as i've uh done the forecast and, and i think you know i'm not the only one metals focus and another uh most likely agree uh, as the demand for solar which is now using more loading of silver than, than before uh, the demand for everything from you know capacitors to printed circuit board and vehicles you know upwards of two ounces now per vehicles in an ev um as that demand grows, we really have not seen huge investment in copper, zinc mines, lead mines. And you know, why am I mentioning these when I talk about silver? Well, because, you know, 62 thirds of all silver is a byproduct of base metal production. Uh, and nor did we see, you know, amounts of investment in, in, in primary silver uh, as well, certainly relative to the projected demand. Uh, so we're, we're in a structural deficit environment for silver, I think. Um, yeah, I agree. And I absolutely agree. It had some, you know, uh, but that's, that, no, that's not a 
that, that's unnecessary, but not, not, not a sufficient condition for a surge. Um, because until very recently, we had a lot of available above ground stocks uh, that if the interest rate environment was favorable, like, like now, you know, high right. interest rates, uh, you would lend the stuff out. And you would close your physical position and, and sell it and maybe swap it out for a bond that gave you, you know, 600, 700 basis points if, you know, if you were taking credit risk, uh, you know, a few hundred basis points uh, above, uh, uh, above treasuries if you, if you were, you know, uh, uh, that would dispose in, in, in your risk appetite. Uh, right. But as, as time moves on, I think silver will increasingly decouple from the vagaries of interest rates. As those inventories above ground get eroded, you know, there's less and less of it available freely to lend and borrow and, and play in the market. Uh, those gaps will have to be closed up by maybe demand destruction. And then we're in a, you know, in a brand new environment. I think some economists like me like to call it uh, sort of strategists. You know, I'm not quite sure what I am uh, <laughs> sometimes is we're an auction price environment where we're functioning above the cost curve. It's no longer the marginal cost of production. It's the marginal revenue unit of silver that determines the price. And, and that's almost impossible to, you know, to determine the a priori of the market. The market has to work and, and find that level. But what does it mean? Well, if I'm short of silver, and I can't get above, you know, I can't incentivize anybody to get rid of their inventory. Mm -hmm. Well, it's physical commodity. I can't use more silver than actually is physically available. You That's know, right. I, I can't go on my computer like I can with money supply and entry. So I have to convince somebody who needs it to give it to me. And then right. why would they get, you know, and how would they give it to me? Well, Essentially, I have to give them enough money to compensate them for the profit and the risk of shutting down or whatever production facility they have. So I can put it maybe in my hundred thousand dollar vehicle uh, that I can't produce with that, that silver. You know, it's right. not going to be direct. You know, uh, an auto company giving money for silver. It'll be the producer of the electronics that are needed by the auto company. Uh, right. And I think that could be a factor for a while until that market comes into an equilibrium and prices are high enough to stimulate demand. And we know it takes upwards of, you know, seven to 10 years to put a new project into production. Um, right. And that that is going to be a very interesting environment in the next few years, uh, I think, for silver and copper in, in particular. Because Agreed. these metals are critical uh, right. to you know the transition to a net zero economy. Absolutely. Up on the uh, my slide deck right now, I've, this is my personal uh, uh, consulting entity. This is my long term. You call it a forecast, but of course, if you're out to 2050, it becomes a crystal ball more quickly than you realize. But uh, you know, here's the, the aggregate silver demand. We've had a big bump here in 23. This has already occurred. That's water under the bridge where solar PV is nearly doubled and we see a trajectory on solar demand that is going to remain quite high, you know, close to 300 million troy ounces uh, a year for some time. Sure. Um, you're seeing a growth in the yellow of EVs. You know, the loadings in, in, a, in a Tesla these days are on silver, so over a troy ounce uh, per vehicle. Um, and so you're, you're going to see more going into, elect, um, you know, the electronics and automotive, as well as electronics in general. And I, I break out semiconductors, consumer electronics, and other electronics. The power distribution and, and building out the grid, um, it, it, it just creates a case where you look at, it really comes down to, well, what's your supply picture? What's your mining picture going to look like? The recycle picture on silver is, is quite frankly, bleak. You know, we're letting over half of the silver escape the system. We're not, we're great at capturing the gold. We're weak at capturing the silver, especially on solar panels. We got to create a uh, an economically viable, you know, silver recovery from solar panels that. Uh, Right now, it's too too much of the, the metal is going to be a one shot to landfill. Um, but it, you come up with these pictures where silver becomes more and more of an industrial metal. I'm not where not clear to me where all the jewelry weight and where all the investment products are, are going to come from. It's it's going to be 
more and more industrial driven uh, long term. And, and that picture, I think most analysts do agree with. Would, would, what do you think? Uh, no, I, I simply agree with that. I, I think um, as, as we you know move along this global electrification of the economy, uh, right. um, this amount of silver per unit GDP yeah. is going to grow and is going to yeah. grow at a much faster pace than our ability to supply it. Um, and, and, you know, and that's, you know, by definition, it can't. Uh, so something is going to have to happen to ration it. And that's, that, that's, that, that's usually, uh, that's usually price. So there's a lot, I think there are a lot that there's lots of work to do. You know, one good start would be to uh, maybe declare it a critical mineral. Uh, th there will have to be policy that makes um, mining and recycling uh, easier. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the market is going to have to provide signals uh, to the primary market and the secondary market uh, to develop technologies and invest um, in this metal. And, and that has to come uh, through some sort of a higher price uh, um, environment uh, to right. compensate for for the risk and the, the time lags, and also the massive volatility. I mean, these prices are very volatile. Um, if you're produce, if you're opening up new, you know, facilities, they may very well operate at the very top of the cost structure. Um, and if you have a market correction, which is typical in this market of 10, 15 percent because of cyclicality. Uh, you know, these guys may go out of business. So you you might have to have prices much higher than we are now uh, to serve as a buffer against these cyclicalities. Um, you know, hedging is one way of doing it. There's probably a role for government um, to, to the, you know, develop regulations uh, for, for, for hedging, some sort of off-take agreements uh, on, on the part of consumers versus uh, producers to guarantee prices some sort of rate base um, guarantees where there are, you know, prices are designed to give a particular yield to investments. Because right now, none of that really exists. And, and we're having problems, uh, you know, and then and, and I, I would say there is a bias within the investment community against uh, resources because they are deemed as being carbon heavy. And it is, and it is very true. Yeah. But you're going to have to have a carbon heavy mine in order to reduce carbon uh, production everywhere else. Um, right. But we'd like to have it both ways. And unfortunately, we can't. And that's going to have to change. Okay. So why don't we wrap on this point? Uh, you, you've given us, <coughs> excuse me, a sense of where you think gold is headed. Now let's talk silver. Where do you see silver by the end of the year? Well, you know, uh, my problem is that um, I was among the most bullish about a year, year and a half ago. I've written right. a series of articles and the right. market has overtaken me. Uh, right. So my official forecasts are uh, a, a little, let, uh, you know, a, a little, uh, a little, a little conservative. So, you know, it's yeah. tough for me to, to, to to say publicly uh, what, what, what we're thinking right now without first publishing it. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, we're, uh, well, well, let's just talk general trend without it, pinning specific it numbers. Just, silver could be overbaked just a little bit, though. I, I agree. It, 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 you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it peel back just a little bit. Yeah. You, you know, there, there are still, we, we still, we, we are yet to see a slowdown, a, a material slowdown in the U.S. economy. Uh that that could be a negative for for the industrial side, you know, not necessarily a contraction in, in, in demand, but we can very well see uh, it, things maybe not 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 go so well. Uh, particularly, if the U.S. central bank uh, doesn't free up, uh, you know, in, in lower interest rates sooner. Right. I mean, if it lowers them later, much later rather than than sooner. Uh, China, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about in the market of from its stimulus, and and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty paltry uh, by historical standards. Uh, so they're having issues as well. Um, right. 
uh, we're, we're seeing EV sale trajectories, you know, underperformed last year, for, for example. Uh, and, 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 you know, we've already talked about the silver loading for, for EVs. You know, that right. might be a, a bit of a negative. And if interest rates that carry remains as high as, uh, as it is now, uh, I think, you know, maybe some spec investors may lose some enthusiasm uh, short term as well, despite of the right. fact we're seeing a deficit. But remember, a, a primary, you know, deficit, and when I say primary recycle and mining, is not necessarily sufficient to see higher prices. So you have to look back to see a situation where we had a record at the time deficit and prices dropped. And, and you know, analysts like, like ourselves had to answer, you know, why is that? Right. I, I have written on it and said, you know, because there is lots of above ground supply in a higher interest environment that makes it into the market. Uh, and this is why we're saying as it becomes more industrial, as these above ground inventories erode, uh, it'd be uh, much less of a driver. Uh, but, you know, but for the next year or two, it, it's still going to be an issue, I think. Right. Well, Bart, I think we've gone a, a little bit long here, but I think we got to try to wrap this up, but uh, give you a chance. Any last final thoughts that you want to share with the, the listeners? You know, I think they're probably tired of listening to me already, and I, I think I've said enough. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, no worries. Again, Bart Mellick, TD Securities, one of the best analysts on the market. I just think the world of you. So, Bart, I appreciate all your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next week, join us when we jump into the topic of platinum. I, I think this is one of the sleeper metals, a sleeping giant that's looming in the weeds. We're going to have uh, from the World Platinum Investment Council, their director of research, Mr. Edward Sterk. Uh, so look forward to that conversation next week. So join us then. Green Rush, mining the energy revolution with Matt Watson.